Our story begins in the town of Oakhurst, somewhere in Greyhawk, specifically at the Old Boar Tavern where I, Talia, had spent a week or so performing for money and free board. Many travellers come and go, but few stay for long. That's why I first noticed Tethlis. He always sat alone in the same corner, accompanied only by flagons of ale. When you're running from someone or something, you learn to recognise the signs in others. Turns out he's a fighter and his battalion had been pretty much wiped out by a dragon, a Shardalan, in the nearby barren lands. It wasn't long before another couple of curious folk came into the inn, a half-orc and a half-elf, somewhat strange travelling companions. Elra here, a half-elf ranger, caught my eye immediately. I haven't come across many half-elves in my time, and it's always interesting to hear another's experiences. As part of the Scarlet Sun Carnival, I spent much of my time in the Feywild as well as the Material Plane. He'd been hunting and found his kill had been taken by an owl bear, which then decided it fancied taking him as well. Korak the Grieved, a barbarian, came across this fray and was able to save Elrahir's life. They came to Oakhurst on the trail of another ranger, a friend, Caracas, and the goblins who had wiped out Korak's clan. Then there is Gurgis, a dwarf who has most definitely been with us for the entire adventure and did not join us three sessions in because he was getting married. A cleric. We heard several rumours about a nearby place known as the Sunless Citadel. Every midsummer, goblins come to the village with a strange red fruit which grants health and vigour to those who consume it. Villagers buy it and have attempted to grow it themselves, but the plants always wither and disappear overnight. There have been rumours of walking shrubs at night and livestock have been found killed, their bodies covered in tiny puncture-like wounds. I suspect it's a band of rogue acupuncturists myself. In the winter, the goblins come again, this time with a white fruit so poisonous that even touching it can kill. Unsurprisingly, nobody is keen to purchase this. The goblins haven't always been here. They arrived about two years after a rather strange human man named Belak passed through, bringing with him his even stranger pet frog. He was asking about the citadel, and it's believed that that's where he went, though he's not been seen since. Just a couple of weeks before my new friends and I arrived, the son and daughter of Lady Oakhurst went to investigate the citadel. They were accompanied by Sir Branford, a paladin of Palor, and by a human ranger. A human ranger named Caracas. Calgan is a fighter and Sharwin a wizard, so they were a capable group, but nobody has heard from them since. So that's how we ended up volunteering to go and see what was going on. Garen, the tavern keeper, was kind enough to secure the aid of Norman, a guide to the citadel. It wasn't a long journey. The Sunless Citadel is a sunken fortress and we had to descend many steps in order to reach the entrance. Much of it is crumbled and ruined. The only sign of life, apparently some giant rats which the group quickly dispatched. I'm not sure I believe them. I was making shapes in the clouds from the sky and didn't even seem to notice any kind of skirmish. We carefully made our way in and I cleverly detected a trap by almost falling into it. But Elra here managed to help me stay above ground. The floor was rigged to give way into a 10 foot drop to a darkened pit. Evidently, a couple of goblins hadn't noticed it as their remains were in various states of decay within. Tethlis couldn't resist climbing in to see whether there was anything to loot, only to be set upon by a giant rat. I gallantly saved him, shooting it with my crossbow and pinning it to the wall. We got Tethlis out before the trap reset and made our way into the next room, a circular room, Four goblin corpses having met a violent and far from natural death. Two more doors. The first led to a room, the floor partially crumbled away with a stone door, locked, the symbol of a dragon intricately carved into it. 
Realising it was a little beyond my lockpicking skills, we turned back, went through the circular room and into a corridor. Again, the floor was partially rubble, the right side giving way to a drop on the left. A pungent odour of bad cooking, wet dog and decay filled the air. No worse than Tethlis's cheesy feet. Until I have booming, stinky feet, cheesy feet of they Stick your nose in between my toes, it'll make you say. I tied a rope round my waist while Korak held the end and carefully made my way to the other end of the corridor. Elra here followed, walking along the rope like a circus act. Gurgis and Chainmail easily following behind, discovering hand and footholds. Tethlis noticed the left side of the floor had areas where it was thin and might be unable to bear weight, so made the sensible decision to move along the right side. Korak came last. Three more doors. The door on the left was, once again, made of stone. This time, the carving was of a dragonfish, the mouth a keyhole. Opposite that door, on the same side as us, a wooden door. Gurgus defeated it bravely, revealing an empty room. Or so we thought. Upon closer inspection, Aura here noticed survivalist markings on the ground, signalling that there were marauders, and to beware. Korak found a water skin and a small pouch of rations, which he recognised as having belonged to Caracas. We opted to go through the wooden door at the end since the stone doors were impassable for the moment. This led to a larger room with a fire pit, gently smoking as the last embers burned out. A cage that had once held something now featured a large, twisted opening, the only things remaining inside a few white scales. A small table held what, at first glance, appeared to be a table of Warhammer minis in the process of being painted. Further inspection revealed it was a small tin of bioluminescent paint and four jade green dragon statuettes. The paint appeared to have been used to graffiti the walls in Draconic, a language none of us could speak. A small pile of rags against the opposite wall did not take kindly to being poked by my mage hand. A small, angry kobold, woken from sleep, found himself pinned to the floor by Korak, while Tethlis was the most manly and Scottish he has ever been, threatening, You speak or you die! The kobold began muttering in common, so I had a little chat with him. After a brief moment of madness, where I began invoking the names of demon lords from hell for no apparent reason, Meepo, the kobold, revealed that the goblins had stolen their dragon god, Kelkrick. He's not a baby dragon, so quite how goblins managed to make off with him is not yet known, but they are sleek it wee buggers. Realising that we have a common enemy, Meepo agreed to take us to the leader of his tribe in exchange for Korak not ripping him apart. I liberated a couple of the jade statues and Tethlis acquired a whip. Meepo led the group to a large chamber past many, many more doors, behind which the more perceptive members of the group could hear muttering, shuffling and barking to the throne room. In a lovely white flowing gown on a stone throne sat Eustra, the leader of the tribe. Her throne was decorated with a carved dragon, a large key hanging from the mouth. Two winged creatures sat atop the walls. Here is where we leave the party until next time, ready with a list of questions for Eustril, having planned to let me do the talking whilst Elrahir and Gurgus use their insightful skills to decide how truthful Eustril is being. She is clearly not happy at Meepo bringing us before her, but she's not going to kill us. Yet. <laughs>